Let me tell you a tale about a boy who became an orphan, an orphan who became a man, a man who became a revolutionary, and a revolutionary who built an empire. Come hear the tale of the rise of a crusader for justice and the betterment of all mankind. My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a series where I talk about all things sci-fi and space lore. Today will be the first in a short series of videos discussing the rise of Auguste Dunlo and the eventual fall of his legacy, Crusader Industries. Before I get started, I'd like to thank you all for watching these videos. I can't do this without your support, and it means a lot that you choose to watch this video today. If this isn't your first time watching one of these videos, be sure you've hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to hear more stories from the verse. Now, let's start with understanding who Auguste Dunlo was and his history. Angeli in the Croshaw system is the first extrasolar planet humanity terraformed and settled. It is home to the oldest human settlements outside of the Sol system, and as such is well developed with a lot of history. The system was named after the first person to navigate a jump point and return, Nick Croshaw. However, another famous figure is also closely linked to Croshaw, one almost equally famous for his impact on human society. Born in 2770, Auguste Dunlow had a mostly normal childhood. His parents had afforded him a decent education, and by the time he was 11, he had been selected as one of the high achievers in his school. As a result, on August 12, 2781, young Auguste was selected to be some of the few of his class to be in the front of a throng of onlookers along a parade route, waving a small UEE flag as Imperator Ulysses Meser, also known as Meser X, drove by to inaugurate his latest experiment. Ulysses had inherited a crumbling empire from his uncle Gaylor who himself had to salvage a disastrous series of losses from the Van Duel. This was after his brother Samuel had ignored the Van Duel threat and focused on terrorizing the population into submission. Gaylor had sought to revitalize the population through construction programs, and as Ulysses was Gaylor's high secretary, he was the man in charge of ensuring everything went smoothly. As a result, when Ulysses took the throne, he also felt that new construction was important. However, unlike his uncle, who believed in smaller projects, Ulysses believed that the only way to improve public morale was grand architecture. So on August 12, 2781, Ulysses was on jelly to commemorate the crowning achievement of this endeavor, Kanos Stadium. However, what he didn't know was that this was also to be his downfall. In order to achieve his goals, Meser X had raised taxes, stripped environmental protections, deregulated the market, eliminated the minimum wage, rewrote treason laws, expanded police powers, and reduced the minimum working age to 10. Needless to say, this had caused even more despair and unrest in the population and his reckless spending on his pet projects had pulled funds away from other governmental programs and into the hands of a few lucky groups. By the time Kano Stadium was nearing completion, the situation had grown so dire that his own children had begun to plot against him. The then 36-year-old Linton Meser and 13-year-old Fiona Meser had hatched a plan to remove their father before he squandered the empire they both felt they should inherit. Linton worked his sources in the Senate and military to back him in the coming confrontation, and Fiona was connected with the anti meser resistance to build her own rebellion, using Marines to train the rebels on how to wage guerrilla warfare and exploit the weaknesses in the UEE military systems, the latter being the move which would change the life of little Auguste and the galaxy as a whole forever. As the little Dunlow finished waving his flag at the passing Imperator's vehicle and watched it creep towards the stadium, he had the perfect view of the explosion. Fiona's rebels had infiltrated the stadium with explosives 
and detonated them. Many of the local residents had been forced to attend the grand opening ceremony. So when the stadium exploded, an untold number of innocent bystanders were injured or killed. The blast would also claim the life of Auguste Dunlow's mother and gravely wound his father. It did not stop there, though. Members of the military who backed Linton quickly ambushed the parade, firing on the Imperator and his entourage. The fighting tore the city apart as members of the coup clashed with loyalist forces. In the end, with his back against the wall, Ulysses ended his own life. Linton would gain the throne over the bodies of hundreds, if not thousands, of dead. Many innocent bystanders, like the Dunlows. Auguste dropped out of school to care for his father, taking jobs with the work crews to clear out the rubble. However, when that work dried up, they found themselves destitute and homeless, without access to the medical care needed to keep him alive. Within a year and a half, Auguste's father would join his mother. At the age of 13, Auguste Dunlow was a homeless orphan, one of many on the streets of Angeli's cities in the aftermath of the coup. We know little of this time in his life as he refused to tell anyone the story. Needless to say, Auguste was forced to grow up fast to survive. That would be where the story ended if it weren't for a non-profit youth homeless shelter named Angeli's Angels. With their help, he got off the streets and finished his education. He then made his way to the University of Angeli on a scholarship where he double majored in business and political science. This is where we first see a twin fire burning inside the young Dunlow. One for success and one for justice. We know he was always driven to succeed and had a natural talent for business. This wasn't for profit or personal glory, however. Dunlow wanted to succeed to turn around and help others get out of their own bad times, giving most of what he had earned through work to charities. We also know for certain that he hated the Mezzers, not just for what they did to him and his family, but how they treated the lives of others so casually for their own schemes of power. While in university, he joined the open anti-Mezzer movement, putting his ideals into action. His charisma caused others to join the cause, and soon the movement in Angeli was growing, almost exclusively because of his actions. He was quickly becoming the leader of the movement, which meant his public profile was becoming large and noticeable. This all came to a head when one day he was set to take a transport to attend a massive anti-Mezzer summit on Terra, but an illness kept him from boarding the transport. As the transport was leaving the atmosphere, it exploded, killing everyone on board. The official statement was that this was a tragic accident. However, many saw this for what it likely was, an attempt by the advocacy to take out one of the largest leaders of the anti-Mezzer movement. His fellow anti-Mezzer activists were concerned for his life and convinced him to take the revolutionary road. Also known as the Bremen Beltway, this route was used extensively during the Mezzer era to smuggle out anti-Mezzer dissidents. It got its name from where it started, the wild system of Bremen. While technically controlled by the UEE, it was protected by the famous homegrown militia of the Bremen Defense Force. Because of their skill, the Mezzers mostly let them manage their own security. However, many in the BDF were staunchly anti-Mezzer themselves. So, they would work with local smugglers to help get radicals safely out of the hands of the advocacy. Smugglers would give these political dissidents sleeping pills and put them into cramped smugglers' crates before starting the journey from Bremen to Nix, where the People's Alliance of Levski would help with refueling and escorts when they could. From there, they would travel to Towhill, where crates were swapped with their Xi'an equivalents in what became known as the Towhill Trampoline because of the often unstable floating botanical mats where the handoffs would occur. From there, the Xi'an smugglers would wake the passenger, as it was deemed safe, before finishing the journey. While technically they still had to sneak by the lackluster defenses of the UEE Periline system of Luawo, in practice, the UEE only monitored four large fleets in the system, so the Xi'an consistently slipped through the sensor nets. Dunlow would eventually talk about his time down the Bremen Beltway describing how nervous he was as he felt the noose of the advocacy tightening around him. 
while also unsure if he could trust the smuggler tasked with getting him to safety. He took his pill and climbed into the cramped crate. When he woke up, Jian was shaking him awake. It was the first time he had ever met a Jian. So, in a moment, all of the anxiety escaped in a scream before breaking down and crying with the realization that he was finally safe. Dunlow ended up, like most of these political outcasts, in a Xi'an pirate space station in the Ayaluf system. And yes, I did say pirate. This might be confusing because Xi'an pirates aren't the same as human ones. Xi'an pirates are officially sanctioned by the Xi'an government, called the Yuaton Wita, or effectively criminal houses. They function as sanctioned criminal syndicates and get permission from the royal house to operate their criminal enterprises. In return, the imperial household expects them to manage and police the unsanctioned criminals of the empire. Ialuth had many stations given to the Yuaton Wita. Because of its placement near the UEE border, it became an end system for the Bremen Beltway. Also because of their status as pirates, the Xi'an could easily blame these activities on them if they were ever caught, giving them a bit of cover. While on this station, Dunlow would have access to other radicals, and even news updates from remote spectrum terminals. It was on one of these stations where he first learned of the failure of the Akari Kray peace treaty, the massacre of Garan II, and the Tide, the last being a group more important to Dunlow than he may have realized. For you see, they were the remnants of Fiona Meser's pet rebels who had killed his parents, and they were about to help him claim justice. After seizing power for himself, Linton ordered all of Fiona's rebel groups to be hunted down, as they were too much of a risk with their knowledge of the inner workings of many military systems and training in asymmetrical warfare. What Linton didn't know was that Fiona had hidden a few of these groups away from her brother, keeping them safe to use against Linton when the time was right. Unfortunately for her, she did not calculate on them going rogue before she was ready. The group renamed themselves the Tide and managed to get a hold of footage from Garen 2. You see, when Garen 2 was discovered, it was found to have sapient life that had developed to a Neolithic level of technology and society. Linton Meser had declared the system off limits and allowed scientists to study the culture and species in detail as a bid to boost popularity. Over time, public interest waned and so did the promises of Linton, especially when it turned out that Garen II was filled with valuable resources. Linton sold the rights to terraform this planet to a company owned by his cousin, who immediately started touring the planet with executives to show off resources in plain view of these natives. When the lead scientist complained to Linton directly, he was blackbagged and sent to a political prison. As a result, the science team seemingly stepped aside to allow the terraforming process. They watched in horror as their cameras captured the entire species choking to death in the new atmosphere. It's at this point where we have speculation. It's likely a member of this science team would then smuggle out footage of the callous planning of the Imperator's cousin along with the genocide of Garen II. When the Tide received this footage, they seemingly coordinated with other groups as they released the footage on Spectrum for the entire Empire to watch. The outcry was tremendous as protests broke out all over the Empire, only to be met with the countless guns of the UE military and advocacy slaughtering protesters as they had done countless times before. However, this time, was different. This time, footage of these massacres would also make it to Spectrum, despite information lockdown set up by the UEE military. Soon, protesters were firing back, and the anti meser revolution had begun. It was at this point that the Xi'an reversed the Bremen Beltway, sending every political dissident willing and able to return to aid the cause, including Auguste Dunlow, back to the UEE. While it is said he helped organize protests on Anjeli, it's also likely that those protests would become pitched battles. So it's almost certain that the orphan boy from the streets of Angeli 
fought to free his home from the tyrants that killed his family. After some months of intense fighting, Linton was finally gunned down by rebel forces, backed by the UEE Senate and people like Auguste Dunlow. The Mezers had fallen, and a new age was set to begin, one where Dunlow felt he could finally do some good. So he moved to Earth and joined a civil rights lobbying firm. And there he was slowly ground down as he came to realize that the change he wanted couldn't happen. He knew he couldn't make the sweeping changes he wanted without the money to pay for the votes. So he would leave politics, but with the lessons he would need to truly make the difference that he hoped for. While working in politics, he came to understand that the new UBE was actively seeking to distance themselves from ship manufacturers with close ties to the former Mezer regime. So he knew that the fastest way to earn the money to make the impact he had hoped for was in ships. It was then that he discovered a struggling shuttle manufacturer, Seraphim Systems. This company was a small company out of Tram on Asura. The company was feeling the same pinch as everyone else on Tram. Years of unchecked mining and industrial growth had turned the sky permanently gray, while drinking water was a scarce resource outside the city. A few years earlier, the city had seen the unchecked wrath of Gaylor Messer, who accused the city of being disloyal, and as a result, most of the businesses had fled, fearing reprisals from the Messer government. Now the city was quickly becoming home to more criminal enterprises than legitimate ones. Seraphim Systems was in a bad spot. They made excellent shuttles, but their attention to detail meant they were too slow to keep up with demand, and they were losing business fast. Their location in Tram meant that few investors were willing to step in to help them pick up the shortfall. Dunlow knew if he could get investors, he would be able to pick up the slack of production and get government assistance using his connections, as politically it was advantageous for the new UEE to help a company out on a planet wronged by the Mezers. Dunlow made a business plan, quartered investors, and offered to buy a majority in Seraphim Systems. However, the board of directors rallied around CEO Jenna Malone and rejected the offer. This surprised Dunlow, who sat down to negotiate further with Malone to find out the reason for the stubborn defiance. During the negotiations, he discovered that Malone, like the CEOs before her, was dead set on keeping the name Seraphim, as the company had always been run as an overtly religious organization. And the name was key to that identity. The word Seraphim is a name for a type of angel in the Abrahamic religions of Earth. While it isn't clear which religion Seraphim Systems was tied to, the results of these discussions between Dunlow and Malone points to a version of Christianity. This is important because it is one of the few overt mentions of religion in human society outside of the Church of the Traveler. Dunlow would then spend a weekend with Malone and her family to discuss his plans to use the company to enact positive change. Thanks to his natural charm and skills of negotiation, he managed to work with Malone and iron out the details securing the purchase of the company and a new name. Seraphim Systems would become Crusader Industries, a name that was chosen to respect the religious foundation of the company while being a bit more marketable. Malone explained the choice in a letter to her employees on the evening of the purchase. Our new name, Crusader Industries, should be considered a commitment by the company, not only to innovate and stay on the forefront of our field, but to vigorously advocate for what is morally right across this planet, system, and even the Empire. By 2799, the company officially incorporated, with Dunlow replacing Malone as CEO. He deployed the seed money he had raised before the sale and used his connections in the Senate to get government contracts by 2801. That year saw the first major profits for the company and also began the tradition which continues to this very day. A significant amount of the profits were earmarked for charitable causes. As the company steadily grew, Dunlow became impatient. He was seeing success with Crusader's early shuttles, 
the modern versions of which can be seen working as public transport on the company's HQ of Orison. But Dunlow needed more money to make the impact he wished to make. He knew to do that, he would need to move beyond government contracts and into the private sector. This, however, would put the young crusader against the ancient dragons of the industry, like Robert Space Industries. He knew that if they were to make that leap, he'd need something new and fresh to really make their mark. Eventually, this idea would bear fruit, but the seed of this new venture would come from an unlikely place. The early 29th century was a rough time for the UEE. Much of the shipping companies that operated under the Messrs were falling apart due to the death of so many ship manufacturers with close ties to the old dictatorial regime. This caused delays in shipping and in more than one instance threatened the lives of entire planets. Crusader was no different, with these delays hampering the delivery of their shuttles to market. Axel Adamson, Crusader's warehouse manager, was with Dunlow on a conference call addressing production delays caused by overdue shipments. During the call, Adamson exclaimed, If we had our own fleet, I guarantee this would not happen. While discussing the cost of buying their own fleet, Dunlow realized that there was a need for large cargo ships on the market. As he would later remark, he came to the conclusion that if they could make shuttles, why couldn't they make larger ships? Dunlow drew up a business plan to present to the board and try and convince them of the idea's viability. Even with his silver tongue, he only managed to barely get a majority vote after a year of discussion and debate. He became convinced that this new interplanetary crafts division was the key to the future of Crusader and spared no expense in recruiting the best and brightest engineers and designers he could get his hands on, offering them significant pay increases and stock options to get them to sign on. The results would pay out dividends, as by 2812, Crusader's large carrier ship would roll off production lines. Named the Jupiter, this massive capital ship was ostensibly a carrier, built to carry their shuttles to market. However, when delivering its cargo, the ship got a lot of attention from the freight ship-deprived companies of the UAE, who quickly requested Jupiters of their own. It helped that the Jupiter was the first ship to be recognized for what would become the staple of all Crusader ships going forward, rugged dependability and ease of repair. All Crusader ships are tough, built to stand up to insane challenges while also being relatively simple to repair and maintain. This has made them the favorites of the government and civilian worlds alike for years, all starting with the development of the Jupiter. It was at this point that Crusader Industries sealed their future, with Dunlow investing the profits from the Jupiter into new production facilities all over the Empire to keep up with demand. With their interplanetary division becoming the major moneymaker for the company, Crusader doubled down on their shipbuilding. This is where a new face enters the picture. A young ship designer and recent graduate student who had been with the company, likely since its founding, Kelly Kaplan. Kaplan would be instrumental in the second ship created by Crusader Industries, and likely the first Starliner built in the post messer era, the Saturn. While we don't know a lot about the Saturn, what's important about it is that Kelly Kaplan was part of the design team. Her role in its creation would lay the foundation for the company's future. As Dunlow was so impressed, he would promote her to lead designer of their next generation Starliner one that would come to define the company to this very day and secure her place in the future of Crusader Industries. The years after the release of the Jupiter and Saturn were times of tremendous growth for Crusader. The company poured more money into their interplanetary division, which was turning around larger and larger profits, which in turn meant more money for Dunlow's pet charities. This also led to some of the most iconic and enduring ships that Crusader would ever produce, with the dual team of the skilled business mind of Dunlow paired with the rising star with a talent for ship design of Kaplan, creating two icons of modern spaceflight. It all would start because of a report published almost a century before. Towards the end of the Mezzo era in the mid-28th century, 
The High Command did a retrospective on the lessons to be learned from the Second Tavaran War, fought almost a hundred years earlier. One of the results was a new understanding of support logistics on interstellar warfare. The study found that the early method for planetary assaults had many flaws. Up until then, the standard procedure was to use small, heavily armored, landing craft filled with medium to heavy infantry to establish a beachhead. Once secure, these troops would then build a landing base to allow for slower, more vulnerable transports to arrive and drop off heavier vehicles like tumbral cyclones and novas. This led to higher casualties, as much of the heavier equipment was not available during the initial landings. It also meant that the heavy vehicles could not redeploy once they arrived as there was no ship to rapidly load and unload while in combat. The famous Battle of Corin Pass was even cited as an example of this failure. In 2605, four Nova tanks were undergoing stress testing after recent maintenance on the planet of Creon in the Caliban system. They then stumbled upon a Tavaran strike team, consisting of a dozen fighters, dropships, and hundreds of infantry. One of the tanks was destroyed in the initial engagement, and the remaining three fell back to a slightly covered alcove called Corin Pass. However, because of comm interference, they were unable to call for support. As a result, they fought a pitched battle for over 16 hours against waves of Tavarin. Even after the local garrison was aware of the events, because of the remote location, it was difficult to drop in support for the beleaguered tankers, which wouldn't have been an issue if the UEE possessed a heavy lift capability. The solution to the problem was twofold. The first was organizational. The High Command created an inter-service logistical support network called Starlift Command, with elements of the Navy, Army, and Marines working closely to deliver personnel and materiel at a moment's notice. The second was a quantum-to-battlefield support spacecraft that could deploy armored units and other assets to a variety of alien terrains while under fire. This meant that instead of amphibious operations focusing on establishing individual firebases to then bring in heavier assault weaponry, this command and its theoretical spacecraft could deliver advanced units directly to active theaters, allowing for tens, hundreds, or thousands of beachheads instead of focusing on a single point. Additionally, forces could rapidly redeploy to areas where more intense fighting was occurring, which would lead to less casualties and faster victories. So in 2814, a formal request for a proposal was issued. It asked for a large, well-protected transport that was jump capable, able to sustain concentrated artillery fire, and able to deploy multiple armored vehicles quickly. Only two serious proposals were entered, one from Aegis Dynamics and the other from Crusader Industries. Crusader took an approach that caught the high command off guard. They expected Crusader to produce a ruggedized and up-armored military version of their Saturn Starliner. Instead, Dunlow and the Interplanetary Division decided to push ahead with their third ship in three years, a custom-built, two-spec military transport that they called the Hercules. The Hercules cost three times that of the Aegis proposal, but the philosophy of the time was that since they already needed to entirely reorganize much of their transport services into a single Starlift command, that a brand new ship purpose-built for this change was a good choice. It also helped that Dunlow had connections with the Senate, and Aegis was still in the doghouse with the UEE. After only being just barely spared destruction due to their ships making up the majority of military forces of the early post meser era. With the contract secured, Crusader would then focus all of their assets into the project for the next four years. The result was designated the M2 Hercules Starlifter, with the first active duty Starlifter unit being formed in May of 2821, seven years after the initial proposal. This first unit put their ships through rigorous exercises and found that the M2 lived up to the reputation that has come to define Crusader ships. It was tough and easy to work on. Because of Crusader's experience with selling to less experienced civilian owners, they designed the ship to be easy to access for maintenance. This meant that experienced military ground crews found the M2 to be simple to work on and allowed them to not have to focus on them as much. The smaller crews could maintain large fleet of Hercules. The UE also found the ship to be dependably rugged, 
In one test, an M2 was able to deploy an armored vehicle and depart while under constant direct artillery fire in a matter of minutes. Soon, the sight of Hercules on a battlefield gave the psychological boost to troops who knew that if an M2 was on the ground, support was with it. While this initial unit showed the value of the M2, other bureaucratic issues with the new Starlift Command caused delays in the ship being deployed in active service. However, that would change in 2824. A group of heavily armed pirates was located in a heavily defended base on a frontier world near the Xi'an border. Orbital bombardment was taken out of the question, as while the group operated from the base, there were many other parts to this pirate crew scattered all over the system. Thus, it would be far more advantageous to take the compound with ground forces to secure intel on the whereabouts of the rest of the pirate operation. In March 2824, two squadrons of Starlifters, accompanied by deep space support fighters, likely vanguards, quietly and quickly deployed troops and an armored column of old tumbrel novas before the pirates even realized they were under attack. The surprise of this heavy assault resulted in no losses by the UE forces, and a significant capture of information that led to two additional pirate bases and the destruction of a small pirate capital ship. All of this was credited to the flexibility of the M2. The M2 became the backbone of Starlift Command over the next two decades, with elements of the command in every single UEE system and countless sub-elements on Ready-5 status, already loaded with tanks and support vehicles ready to deploy specialized forces anywhere in the Empire at a moment's notice. Needless to say, it has become a symbol for the UEE military, even to this very day. Along with this massive success, the Jupiter was also getting militarized, with the UEE army adopting it as its platform to deploy forces and supplies in greater numbers. By 2830, Crusader was likely the primary cargo ship manufacturer for the UEE government, and a darling in the civilian world, and they weren't done yet. Before 2840, Crusader would cement itself as an icon of the industry, when they designed the standard by which all other civilian traffic would be judged by, the LH-307 Genesis Starliner. While there is no firm date, the Genesis was the brainchild of the lifelong Crusader designer, Kelly Kaplan, one of the key designers on the Saturn project. She was given lead control of the Genesis, likely shortly after the completion of the Hercules. The key to the success of the Genesis over its competition, and even the Saturn, was in its ease of customization. Kaplan created the frame and roll design process, which allowed for multiple specific variants of the ship to be built alongside their generic counterparts on the exact same assembly lines. So while this standard variant could hold 40 passengers, their luggage, and eight crew, a company could also purchase a racing variant, a heavily armed cargo transport, a luxury liner, or even a data running variant that would be built right next to its generic cousin at similar costs. With Crusader's reputation for ruggedness and easy maintenance, the Genesis exploded into the civilian transport scene, with just about every transit company clamoring to purchase their own line of Genesis ships for their fleets in order to reduce cost of maintenance while continuing to offer diverse services. Even the highest office of the UEE government would buy their own custom Genesis, eventually dubbed Imperator 1. This was a customized experimental test bed offering luxury accommodations along with being a command and control to run the government while the Imperator is off-world. Crusader Genesis Starliners became so ubiquitous that in the 2850s, the term going on crusade was a popular euphemism for traveling while on vacation. This should show you just how ingrained Crusader had become in the mind of the public at large. By 2846, Augustin Lowe had felt that he had accomplished what he had set out to, and retired from his position as CEO, having managed to live the life of an orphan, revolutionary, and built a business empire all in one lifetime. He would turn his attention to his philanthropy, including the Auguste Dunlow Foundation and the Dunlow Fellows, which is dedicated to scholarships in underprivileged and underrepresented students to help unlock the potential for future business and scientific leaders. For the next 20 years, a series of CEOs would take the reins of Crusader Industries. They all were devoted to the same promise as Dunlow, to give a large percentage of the profit to charitable organizations. Then, at the peak of Crusader's power, 
the board elected a wild card to head the company. In 2863, Kelly Kaplan would be installed as Crusader's CEO. This was a move that no one had anticipated, and she was likely the first ship designer to take the role which had previously been held by career business leaders. Investors were nervous, not only because of her lack of experience, but because her bold moves to change the company. You see, in 2851, a nav jumper named Toshi Aaron discovered a jump point into a system previously unknown to the UEE, a system that this jumper would name Stanton. When the UEE surveyed the system, they found it was already settled by squatters, rebels, and prospectors. At first, they paid them no mind, but they quickly discovered that the new system had three super-Earths inside the green zone, ready for terraformation. On top of that, they discovered a large jump point to Terra, making it a faster route for trade between the two halves of the Empire. As a result, the UEE would evict these previous inhabitants. Unfortunately, because of the slow recovery of the economy, after the fall of the Mezers, there wasn't much call to resettle the system. But the UEE couldn't just abandon a lucrative trade route. So when Art Corp approached them to buy a continent on one of the planets, the UEE Senate found their solution, sell these planets to the major companies of the Empire. Crusader was one of the companies approached by the UEE due to their close ties with the government. They were initially offered the gas giant of Stanton II and the frozen world of Stanton IV, sold as a buy one, get one free. However, Kaplan saw potential in the low mass gas giant, the lattice work of floating platforms built by the military in Stanton II's atmosphere offered them a central location to build their large ships. They would also be unhindered by red tape for any future expansion of production, being able to expand the platforms as much as they wanted, so to Kaplan, it was all they needed. This gamble worried investors, but it would pay off. Consolidating their construction of future Hercules and Genesis ships onto the shipyards of the platform city resulted in a 40% reduction of costs on the back end. Kaplan would name their new HQ Orison, an archaic English word meaning prayer. This was symbolic of the risk she took by buying the planet and its moons, and a nod to the company's origins, of which she had been a part of. After the purchase of Stanton II, which would eventually be renamed Crusader after the company who now owned it, Kaplan would not rest. She followed up the purchase of the planet with another new ship, this time a dedicated infrarunner and a not-so-secret blockade-running ship they would call the Mercury Star Runner. The choice to design such a controversial ship was likely rooted in Auguste Dunlow's own history of being smuggled out of the UEE for his protection, combined with the legitimate need for larger infrarunning ships in the Empire. Infrarunning has been an occupation in the Star Citizen universe for centuries. It is practically a requirement of any and all spacefaring civilizations in the verse, the lack of faster-than-light communications means that the best way to send messages between systems is to physically carry them through jump points. This is done by automated messenger drones that download data from relay stations at the mouth of a jump point, and then travel through the space-time anomalies to dock with another station on the other side, which then forwards the message using light-speed communication. This means that it is both very easy to intercept messages as the drones are rarely protected, and very slow, as the drones wait until a certain point in storage or time before taking their trips to the jump point. For secure and fast communication, individual ships would be used to ferry this information from one point directly to another, cutting down the lag time. These infrarunning ships would be fitted with specialized databases for extra security and storage. However, they were likely often modified ships and not standalone ones. Kaplan, seeing the need for a dedicated fast infrarunner, quickly got to work with the interplanetary design team to build one, with a few extra add-ons. The role of smugglers in the creation of Crusader Industries cannot be discounted. Without the clandestine traders, the company, and possibly the new UEE itself, would not exist. As a result, this infrarunner was given a large cargo capacity and a shielded crawl space under the server racks to allow for some less than legal cargo capacity. 
This could easily be justified as protection for inforunners themselves, as they were frequently the target of pirates and criminals for their valuable information cargo, and the cargo capacity justified as being just for vehicles, in case these rugged, fast ships needed to deliver to remote outposts not reachable by conventional spaceships. In order to really show the worth of this unusual ship, Crusader would test it through an unorthodox means. The Abel Baker Challenge is a highly dangerous underground ship race. While it's not technically illegal, it has been seen as more cutthroat endurance race, and its financial backers remain anonymous to this very day. The race takes place in the binary star system of Baker. The system itself has three highly toxic and dangerous planets. Baker 1 is so close to the suns that it reaches dangerously hot temperatures even for most conventional spacecraft. Baker 2 is so toxic and corrosive that it is able to rapidly dissolve most modern hull and construction materials. Baker 3 is a rapidly growing ice giant with massive ice crystals on its surface. The thing that sets the Abel Baker challenge apart from its competitors is that it changes every year. One race has pilots around Baker 1, extremely dangerous because of the heat of the suns. In another race, they had to go to Baker 3 to navigate the large ice crystals. And yet, in a different race, there was a stage called Breathing the Vapors that involved ring targets placed very close to Baker 2's toxic atmosphere. Because of the unregulated nature of the race, there is also a significant number of casualties that occur during the challenge. As a result, just completing the race is considered an honor, and doing so multiple times sets the pilot and their ship as legends. So, Crusader entered a pilot and their experimental Mercury Star Runner into the challenge. Twice, completing it both times. This demonstrated that the ship shared the same ruggedness of its predecessors, while also giving it a very down-to-earth appeal. Crusader was saying that they're making the ship to be survivable and willing to bend the rules, making it more appealing to corporations and criminals alike. The stunt worked wonders with the orders coming in from civilians, companies, and even the UEE itself to replace their aging older inforunners. By the 30th century, Crusader Industries had been one of the premier transportation ship manufacturers for over a century, but their golden age had passed. Kaplan's bid to encourage other companies to establish outposts on Crusader's moons was considered a failure, as most companies weren't willing to abide by the stringent rules Crusader would enforce on these locations. Meanwhile, companies like Musashi Industrial Starflight Concern and Drake Interplanetary were competing on their level. Misk stole their crown when it came to transporting goods in the civilian world, and Drake was stealing their frontier customers with their cheaper alternative to the costly but rugged and simple Crusader designs. So in a bid to win back some of their customers, Kaplan would apply her famous frame and roll techniques to the venerable Hercules. This would result in many interesting and unique variants of the M2, including a refueler and an information runner. However, the most iconic of these variants, and the one that stuck the most, was the A2. This was a dedicated heavy gunship, with the M2's dependable armor and added weapons while sacrificing part of the transportability for a dedicated bomb deployment system. The A2 proved so popular that it quickly became part of Starlift Command, seeing multiple combat deployments alongside the M2. However, by 2940, Crusader would take this variant system even further with the development of a civilian version of the Hercules. Dubbed the C2, this ship lost the armor of the M2 and A2 variants in a bid to take back some of the civilian cargo market from their competitors at Misk and Drake. As the ship was envisioned as a ship for frontier planets without much infrastructure to transport vehicles and cargo with ease, this would mark the end of this high point for Crusader Industries as a company. As, unbeknownst to the public, a dark shadow had begun to envelop the planet. A shadowy, nine-tailed serpent who was poised to bring ruin to the House of Dunlow. By 2940, cracks were showing in Crusader Industries' shell. While they were still one of the most successful businesses in the UEE, their decision to buy the low-mass gas giant, Crusader II, was proving to be a strain. Kaplan seems to earnestly want to ensure the health and happiness 
of the residents of Orison, but control of the space outside of the city was temporary at best, especially when it came to their moons. This is illustrated by the fate of what has become known as Grimhex. Completed in 2903, the station was built to allow groups of independent miners to mine the mineral wealth around the third moon of Crusader, known as Yella. Crusader approved the construction of a green imperial housing exchange station as part of Kaplan's plan to sublet outposts to other companies. It was built in one of the larger asteroids of the belt around the moon, which was designed as an extended stay miniature town with all the amenities required for the miners to live and work around the moon. While initially successful, the mineral wealth of the belt began to dry up in 2933, and soon the station could no longer make enough credits to stay open, and was forced to shutter its doors by 2938. Shortly after the last legal resident had left, the station was reopened by squatters who gave new life to the facility. Initially, they were no more than harmless vagrants and petty criminals, so Crusader largely ignored them. However, by 2943, a more violent group arrived that would change the station and the entire Stanton system forever. The same year that Green Imperial ceased operations in Stanton, a prison transport and its escorts were ambushed and ripped out of quantum travel above Terra. Quickly, the escorts were efficiently and ruthlessly destroyed, and the transport was disabled. The resulting boarding action killed every single police officer on the ship, rescuing only one prisoner. He was the leader of the Rangda Syndicate of Terra Prime, Albert Sinkhole Holden. Investigators after the fact were puzzled, as the attack had all the hallmarks of professionals, but they left one of their own dead behind, which was unusual. The only identifying mark was a picture of a snake entwined over a nine on the corpse of the dead assailant. They believed this was a red herring and planted by the Rangda Syndicate who was truly responsible for the rescue to throw off any future investigation. However, that changed when a day after the raid, Holden was found dead in space with a single bullet to his head. No one knows why the group went to all the trouble of freeing Holden only to kill the syndicate leader themselves. The group was next seen in a heist of a caterpillar filled with valuable resources over Magnus. And over the next several years, the gang became more and more prolific and were linked to incidents in over a dozen systems that involved abductions, murderers, robberies, and the destruction of public and private property. Soon, they became known as the Nine Tails. While it's unknown if they called themselves by that name at the start, they do seem to embrace the name now. But most insiders from the gang seem to refer to themselves as simply the Nines. But there is still some confusion as to the iconography and meaning behind the gang itself. Their colors are consistent, a dark blue, turquoise, and neon pink. And while their main symbol is a stylized Nine using blocks, the rest of their gang attire seems to indicate different origins for the name. On their armor, they often have the Japanese kanji for the mythic nine-tailed fox known as the Kitsune. This creature is a shape-shifting trickster demon who can cause misfortune to others, but can also be seen as a positive protector spirit. However, lower level gang members wear jackets with a snake wrapped around a number nine. Snakes are also part of Japanese mythology, but are also fairly prevalent in Japanese organized crime in the form of tattoos. These are worn as symbols of good and bad luck, often interpreted as to mean there is power and wisdom in going through bouts of bad luck and bad times, that through the struggle you can be mighty. While it isn't certain, I would speculate that the Nine Tails have adopted the ancient Japanese icons as a way of grounding their gangs and the identity of the Yakuza of old. The fact that their lower level enforcers are the only ones to wear the snake is symbolic of them having to do their time before rising the ranks. This would mean that their name actually is a reference to the Kitsune, as their higher level gang members proudly inscribe their armor with the proper kanji. Thus, they seem to revel in being powerful agents of chaos, like the nine-tailed fox of legend. After four years of seemingly random attacks, in early 2942, incidents involving the Nine Tails suddenly stopped. 
law enforcement officials secretly hoped that internal divisions might have finally ripped the gang apart. But they were soon to be proven wrong, as they re-emerged in the old Green Imperial Station around Yella, now known as Grimhex. The Ninetales made the residents a simple offer, either support the Nines or die. The residents put up little resistance to the takeover. According to sources, anyone who opposed the gang got tossed out an airlock, while those offering no objections were allowed to stay and potentially prosper. They protected their new home fiercely and established a working relationship with the local smuggling ring, partially run by Wallace Klim, and a local info broker known as Rudo. Together, the Ninetales began to expand their operations, reaching the full length of the Stanton system. Initially, when confronted by Crusader security, residents of Grimhex denied that the Ninetales had set up shop in their station. But by the time this was proven to be untrue, the Ninetales had grown far too large for Crusader security alone, who was proving to be far too under-equipped and trained to deal with the escalating threat. They refused any kind of direct assault unless assisted by the UE advocacy or military forces, as there were, and still are, civilians on the station being used as, effectively, human shields by the Ninetales, as well as an unknown number of forces protecting the station. As a result, there has been a crime wave that has swept through the Stanton system. The Nine's activity has possibly encouraged other rival gangs to set up shop, like the Dusters and the Nova Riders. And they are almost assuredly directly responsible for the rise of a powerful rival syndicate, the Otoni Syndicate, setting up shop in Stanton, as their injuring of Ticia Pacheco caused her to lose her job with Blackjack Security and into the arms of the Syndicate, setting up the potential for a gang war fought for the future of Stanton. A topic for another video. They also led to one of the most influential events in the system's history, the Jumptown Wars. A drop in the price of minerals caused a strain on many local independent traders' livelihoods. At the same time, due to a rise in criminal activity and lack of oversight, a lab was built inside an abandoned research outpost on Yella, nicknamed Jumptown, to produce the popular recreational drug known as Widow. Local smugglers had been buying the drug and selling it in Grimhex for some time. However, when the word got out that there was a significant profit to be made, former legitimate haulers and mercenaries got in on the deal. This caused a full-blown drug war, with various groups vying for control of the lab and the incredible profits to be had. While this is speculation, considering the Nides controlled the station and thus the flow of drugs, they also likely made the most profit acting as go-betweens between users and those shipping the drugs to the station, with Wallace Klim acting as their dealer and distributor for the rest of the system, and Rudo to contract enforcers to maintain their control over the Widow trade. Thus, their sudden rise from a small gang to a massive system-wide syndicate begins to make sense. It is at this point that the UEE government began to recognize that Kaplan and Crusader were no longer in control of the situation routinely requesting her presence in Congressional Committee on the Interior to answer for the rise of criminal activity in the system she was trusted to maintain order in. The UEE was nervous because similar situations had played out to devastating effects multiple times. Both the Nexus and Pyro systems were claimed by corporations that fell apart shortly after, allowing for violent criminal elements to take root and become major hazards for surrounding UEE systems. The government was already dealing with the financial and political fallout of having been forced to retake Nexus from criminal groups that had called the system home for almost 300 years, and they did not want a repeat of Nexus in Stanton. In response, Crusader offered a solution to the problem through the creation of Crusader Cares, a program to increase security spending and outsource some of their security concerns to small independent pilots and orgs. This was the brainchild of Intembe Wilkins, a brilliant and resourceful young up-and-comer who had headed the Crusader-sponsored Operation Sword of Hope to bring relief supplies and aid to the war-torn planet of Charon. His experience in working with mercenaries and security personnel while not upsetting the humanitarian crisis on the planet made him the most qualified to deal with the spiraling crime situation in the system. It is yet to be determined if this initiative has proven successful, 
but it does mark the start of a change in how Crusader Industries has approached its business. While the company still donates most of its profits to charities, more and more of these profits are going into just keeping the peace in the system, a peace that seems to be a losing battle, as the Ninetales are only getting stronger year to year. Nothing illustrates this change better than the most recent Crusader ship to be developed, a massive departure from their trade and cargo ships of the past, their first dedicated combat ship, the Ares Starfighter. The ship itself was built in 2949 in collaboration with Baron, who were asked to build a brand new weapon for the company's first offensive ship. This weapon was the size 7 Baring SF7. The purpose of the ship seems to be directly related to the rise in crime in the Stanton system, a ship designed to combat the increasing threat of the Ninetales who have managed to acquire multiple large ships, including at least one Idris-class frigate. The SF-7 was built in two variants, the energy-based SF-7E and the ballistic-based SF-7B. As a result, there was two distinct variants of the Ares constructed, with the SF-7E going into the Ion and the SF-7B going into the Inferno, both designed to work together in packs to deal with ground and space-based targets, specifically the larger threats that lurked in the Stanton system. In the end, the Ares is still a Crusader ship and has the same ruggedness and ease of maintenance as its older relatives, and is seen by Crusader as a smaller yet more practical solution to frontier defense against larger sub-capital and capital ships both of which are more and more ending up in the hands of larger criminal organizations, especially in fringe frontier systems. The ship only released at the end of last year, 2951, and has some mixed reactions from users. Unfortunately for Crusader, the ship did not make it in time to deal with the biggest direct threat that the Nines have ever attempted against the company. In August of 2951, the Ninetales blockaded one of the Crusader-owned L-Point stations, Crusader security was forced to call in local mercenaries to deal with the issue. While eventually the Ninetales did retreat from their blockade, the full purpose of the entire event is still unknown. However, the Ninetales have repeated this over and over for almost the entire year, putting pressure on Crusader security, who has routinely been forced to rely more on contract help. A pattern has begun to emerge. As Ninetales have grown more bold, Crusader security has struggled to keep the peace, with more of their supposedly safe zones being infringed upon. Now, the threat is looming over the Prayer City itself, as rumors of a Ninetales action on the city of Orison have begun to circulate, an action that may break the backs of the overstretched group and bring the horrors of these self-styled demons to the front door of paradise. It seems like the house that Dunlo built is teetering on the edge of disaster. A disaster where a single group or person like yourself might be the difference between chaos and order, between keeping the dream alive or seeing it fall to ruin. For now, only time will tell. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the rise and fall of Crusader Industries. Be sure to stay up to date with future videos like this by subscribing to the channel. I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'd like to thank those on screen now who support me on Patreon to keep this content going. I'm currently trying to raise enough to hire an editor who can help me increase the quality and quantity of videos coming, including a timed Patreon exclusive where I cover the entire history of the Star Citizen universe, from the very beginning of what we know to today. If that sounds like something you enjoy, think about joining my Patreons for as little as $5 a month. Now, what do you think? Is Crusader doomed to fall? What is the long-term plan of the Ninetales? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, remember, Exhistoria ad Astra.